Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Revenue Recognition's Impact on Engineering in Construction. We will be getting started shortly, but first, I wanted to take a minute to go over the format of today's webinar. All phones have been placed on mute for this webinar. If you have any questions throughout, please use the questions tab in the menu. We will address questions at the end of the webinar as time permits. We will also be recording this session and the recording will be sent out following the webinar. Again, thank you for joining us. At this point, I would like to introduce today's presenters. As a principal in Bloom Shapiro's Accounting and Auditing Group, Marendra Shah is responsible for audit planning, field work, and supervision of staff on, in, on construction, independent schools, and manufacturing engagements. During the engagement, he also consults with the financial management staff on ways to structure their financial statements and disclosures and has regular interaction with the audit and finance committees. Varendra has expertise in the construction industry. That experience involves working with contractors on their annual financial statements, working with owners in the defense of construction claims, and working with municipalities and higher educational institutions on their school construction programs. Varendra also leads our effort to prepare meaningful management comments that come to our attention during the review or audit. These comments may include items such as internal controls, accounting policies, and cash and inventory management. As a manager in our accounting and auditing department, Steve Treglia provides audit services to clients in a wide variety of industries, including construction, manufacturing, wholesale distribution, and retail. I'll now like to hand it over to Varendra to begin today's presentation. Good morning. Uh, our today, our today's agenda uh, is uh, pretty much to walk you through the AICPA task force update. Uh, the list of revenue recognition standards that has been issued till date, uh, talk about the five-step model on revenue recognition, and talk about the major impacts on the construction industry, uh, walk through some of the examples as it relates to the five-step model, talk about some special considerations, uh, provide you with an overview of presentation and disclosures, and also talk about the effective date and transition methods, and then provide you with some practical considerations to assist you with the implementation of the new standard. On May 28, 2014, FASB issued the new revenue recognition standard. Now, this standard eliminates the transaction and industry-specific revenue recognition guidance under current U.S. GAAP and replaces it with a principle-based approach for determining revenue recognition. Given the significant impact of this standard, the AICPA has formed 16 industry task forces that includes Engineering and Construction Revenue Recognition Task Force to help develop a new accounting guide on revenue recognition. The task force has identified seven key issues that are listed on this slide that impact the construction industry and has provided additional guidance on those issues. As of today, five of those issues have been finalized and two are currently out there for exposure to gather feedback from industry participants. They are expected to be finalized shortly in the next few months. Now this slide provides you with an overview of all the amendments that have been issued by FASB in response to feedback received from stakeholders for clarification and more guidance since the original standard came out in May 2014. With that, I'll hand this over to Steve, who will walk you through the first step, which is identifying the contract with the customer. So I think everyone knows the basics of a contract, and I think within the construction industry, um, there's plenty of contracts to go around. Um, and the new guidance kind of lays um, four, four or five key points of a contract. I'm not going to get too much into detail about those four or five key points. They're pretty basic. Um, but the one that I did want to talk about um, is the collectability being assessed. And I know usually um, new customers uh, work and involve credit checks. Uh, you guys do background checks, credit checks for those new customers. And, and that's the first step that they want you to take when you're assessing these collectability of contracts. And generally, you're going to be fine, but the new RevRec says that if you don't, in theory, think any contract will be collectible, then you're going to be needing to potentially not recognize that revenue. 
And that sounds pretty basic, but the one thing that this is important and you must continually reassess this throughout the contract life. So when you start the contract, they have a good credit check, everything looks good. Going forward, um, you, this has to be something that keeps continually getting assessed. Um, and I think that's the key point that they want you to focus on. And the other thing is contracts being combined at or near the same time um, with the inception of a contract. So essentially, if you have a contract that has a single commercial objective, then you're going to want to look at that as one single contract instead of breaking out into a couple. And I think the best part of this is if you're building a building, but there's no structural, but there is structural and miss metal work, you might normally want to split that to two contracts. But the new rev rec is just saying that you should have one contract and multiple performance obligations. Performance obligations are going to be talked about in step two. Uh, Render will be back on there, and that's going to be a little more complex. Um, so you'll hear that word thrown around a lot. But if you have more than one performance obligation, it doesn't mean you should have more than one contract. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Brendra. Now, once you've identified that you have a contract, the next step is identifying the performance obligation within the contract. This is the key to the revenue recognition standard. In the past, everything was being done at the contract level. Now, you got to go one step further and everything is going to be revolving around performance obligation because that's your new unit of accounting for applying this standard. Now, when we look at the definition of performance obligation, it is a promise to transfer to the customer a good or service or a bundle of goods or services that is distinct or a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. And a promised good or service is distinct if it is both capable of being distinct and distinct in the context of the contract. We are going to review several examples to get a thorough understanding of performance obligation. Now, the key to the definition is, can the customer benefit from the good or service on its own or together with other readily available resources? And is the good or service separately identifiable from other promises in the contract? The objective is to determine whether the nature of an entity's promise is to transfer individual goods or services to the customer or to transfer a combined item to which the individual goods and services are inputs. Another important factor to consider is whether the entity provides a significant service of integrating various goods and services that represent the combined output for which the customer has contracted. A combined output might include more than one phase element or unit. Another key thing to determine is whether the risk is inseparable with regard to the separate goods and services that are being transferred to the customer and that's being promised in the output. Now, significant judgment will be required to determine whether all of the promises in a contract should be accounted for as a single combined performance obligation particularly when assessing contracts such as engineering, procurement, and construction, or design and build contracts. Another significant aspect would be a change order as well. With regard to your change order, if it relates to the change in scope and or price of the original promised good or service, then there are no significant changes in how it is accounted for. However, if the change order is for a performance obligation that is distinct within the context of a contract and has a standalone selling price, then it would need to be recognized separately. For example, if a contractor is out there for constructing the main building and a change order gets done for building a storage facility because the owner wants to do that, now, the contractor doesn't want to go back and you know do the entire new contract, but just wants to write a change order, which is good. But internally, that change order, which is for building a storage facility, has to be accounted for separately. So that's that's the major difference with regard to how you would account for a change order that's that's distinct. 
Now, when the standard came out back in 2014, there was not much distinction between immaterial performance obligations and material performance obligations. So there was a lot of feedback provided, and FASB finally came out with an amendment that says that an entity is not required to assess promised goods or services if they are immaterial in the context of the contract with the customer. And this evaluation is based on materiality at the contract level. Therefore, an entity does not need to evaluate whether the aggregated immaterial promised goods or services are material at the financial statement level. And again, when you are applying this immaterial goods or services concept, it should be applied consistently to similar promises in similar contracts. Now let's look at the example of a significant integration service. In this example, a contractor enters into a contract to build a hospital for a customer. The entity is responsible for the overall management of the project and identifies various promised goods and services, including engineering, site clearance, foundation, procurement, construction, installation of equipment, and finishing. Now, the promised goods and services are capable of being distinct. So there are a lot of promised goods and services in this example. However, they're not separately identifiable within the context of the contract since the promise is to transfer a combined item to which the promised goods or services are inputs. This is evidenced by the fact that the entity provides a significant service of integrating the goods and services, which are the inputs, into the hospital, the combined output for which the customer has contracted. Thus, the entity accounts for all of the goods and services in the contract as a single performance obligation. So this is a basic example that kind of talks you through the significant integration service that's being talked about in the standard. So for construction industry as a whole, nothing changes in this example because they've always been accounted for, you know, what is the end product that they're delivering? And in this case, it's pretty much to build a hospital. Now in the next example, you would see that there are a couple of different performance obligations. So if those were accounted for as one in the past, now they will have to be accounted for separately in two different uh, contracts. So now in, in this case, an entity contracts with a customer to sell a piece of equipment and installation services. The equipment is operational without any customization or modification. The installation required is not complex and is not capable of being performed by several, and is capable of being performed by several alternative service providers. Now, there are two performance obligations because of the following. The entity is not providing a significant integration service. The entity's installation services will not significantly customize or significantly modify the equipment. The equipment and the installation services do not each significantly affect the other, meaning they are not highly interdependent or highly interrelated. In short, if the customer can enjoy the benefit of the final product on its own or with something else, then that's a separate op performance obligation. Now, this is a pretty common example in the construction industry, which relates to design and build or design and construction. Now, in this example, contractor ABC, a specialty construction firm, enters into a contract with the Department of Transportation to design and construct a tunnel and a roadway through the tunnel. The project has two phases, design and construction, and the contract provides separate compensation for each phase. The question that will come up with, are there two obligations or one? The answer to this question is, it depends. Now, given that this contract is a specialty construction firm, it has specialty in just doing the design work and the construction work. So it has two separate teams that can do both, and they do both types of work. So now, in this specific contract, if the design phase is independent of the construction phase, and then no significant changes are expected throughout the construction phase. And if there are any significant changes, and if those would be handled by the owner's team and not by the contractor themselves, 
then the design phase can be accounted for separately as a separate obligation, and the construction would be a separate contract. However, if the project is complex and the contractor will be required to frequently alter the design of the tunnel and roadway during construction, then the contractor will conclude that the design services and construction services are not distinct in the context of the contract and instead should be combined and accounted for as one performance obligation. The key here is pretty much are they integrated and interrelated to an extent that you cannot segregate the risk. If the risk of the design and the construction is in, is in a manner that you cannot segregate those, then those contracts have to be combined because they are for the same single performance obligation that's going to be delivered to the end customer. Now, now let's look at another example, which is construction and fabrication. An engineering and construction company has a subsidiary that provides fabrication services. Both companies have entered into separate contracts with the customer for providing services related to the same bridge. Is there a single performance obligation or are there multiple performance obligations? Now, if the fabrication subsidiary is fabricating major sections of a bridge in its own fabrication yard in a substantial part of the construction services involves constructing the bridge by installing the fabricated components to produce the combined output of a single bridge, the fabrication and construction should be considered a single performance obligation if the entity concludes that the risk of fabrication of the individual components of the bridge is inseparable from the risk associated with construction of the bridge. Again, it goes down to the slide where we talk about the risk being inseparable. So basically, in this case, fabrication is a major component and it's going to be used in the construction phase and, and hence it has to be recorded. So both the contracts have to be recorded together as one and because it, it's going to be towards the combined output. Now moving on to step three, which is determining the transaction price in a contract. Now the key focus is evaluating issues involving variable consideration. Now the total estimated revenue would include under the new standard is the basic contract price, your contract options, your change orders, your claims, and you also have to evaluate any contract provisions for penalty which includes your liquidated damages and incentive payments that would include award fees and performance incentives. You have to exclude your sales and other similar taxes collected from customer. If you have any non-cash consideration, which is not very typical in the construction industry, but if you do have it, then you have to include the fair value of, of, of that consideration. And the estimates must be revised each period throughout the life of the contract when events occur and as uncertainties are resolved. Now, when we talk about variable consideration, uh, the focus is on unpriced change orders, claims, and then any incentives or penalties that are included as part of the contract. In the past, you would only focus on the lump sum price or the fixed price that's there in the contract, and then you would deal with the change orders as you move along uh, with your project. But under the new standard, you are required to consider variable consideration for your claims, for your incentives or penalties that are included as part of your contract, and also for your on-price change order as you, as you move along the process. Now, if you have variable consideration, the standard provides you two methods to deal with that. The first one is the expected value method, and the second is most likely amount. Under the first method, which is the, more, the expected value method, if you have a range of possible outcomes, which are more than few, then you would assign a probability to each of your outcomes and then calculate a probability weighted amount for those range of possible outcomes. But if you have a scenario where the answer is kind of a yes or a no, then you would use the most likely amount 
as, as the method to arrive at your variable consideration. So that's your step one. So once you have your variable consideration, you have to kind of review the constraining estimates of variable consideration, meaning that you gotta look at your variable consideration that has been determined using one of the methods, and then you have to recognize revenue only to the extent it is probable that a significant reversal of cumulative revenue recognized will not occur when the uncertainty associated with the variable consideration is subsequently resolved. In short, once you, are, once you have your variable consideration amount, you have to look at the facts and circumstances to analyze it further, saying that only certain amount of that variable consideration should be part of your contract price to the extent you expect that a significant reversal won't occur later on. Another key thing is the financing component. Uh, it excludes the retainage though. So if you have contracts with payment terms greater than one year, then an entity should adjust the consideration received for the effects of the time value of money, again, if it's significant. Uh, with regard to your non-cash consideration, it should be the fair value at contract inception. Now, the existing U.S. gap or the legacy U.S. gap was based on a realization concept under which revenue was not recognized until it became fixed or determinable. So when a fee was subject to a contingency, an entity typically concluded that the fee was not fixed or determinable until the underlying contingency was resolved. Now under topic six or six, an entity estimates variable consideration and includes it in the transaction price if the entity concludes that it is probable that the estimate of variable consideration is not subject to a risk of significant revenue reversal. As a result, in many cases, variable amounts may be recognized earlier under topic six or six. Now, now let's look at some of the examples under the variable consideration. The first one has to do with the award fees. A contractor enters into a contract for building a casino. The contract price is 100 million plus a 5 million award fee if the expansion is completed before the holiday travel season. The contract is expected to take one year to complete. The contractor has a long history of performing this type of casino construction work. If the job is not finished before the holiday travel season, the contractor receives no award fee. The contractor believes, based on its past experience, that it is 95% likely that the contract will be completed in advance of the holiday travel season. Now, how should the contractor account for the award fee? Again, you have to kind of consider your variable consideration methodology here. So in this case, there are two possible scenarios. Use 100 million or 105 million for contract price. Given that there are two scenarios, the use of most likely amount method for determining variable consideration is most appropriate. So the contractor decides to use 105 million since it expects to complete the work within a year. The estimate will be reassessed and adjusted as needed if the expected outcome changes. Now the contractor, once the Initial variable consideration amount has been finalized. The contractor concludes that the variable consideration is not constrained because of the following factors. Contractor has a long history of performing this type of work. It is largely within the contractor's control to complete the work before the holiday travel season, and the uncertainty will be resolved within a relatively short period of time. So at the end of the day, if the contractor is able to document that they're comfortable with the factors that supports the recognition of that revenue, then that variable consideration would become part of your contract price as you move forward with your revenue recognition. Now, assume the same facts. This is for the claim uh, criteria that also has to be assessed for your variable consideration. Assume the same facts as earlier example, except that due to reasons outside of the contractor's control, for example, customer cost delays, 
the cost of the contract that ex far exceeds the original estimates, but a profit is still expected. Based on the underlying contractual terms, the contractor has an enforceable right to be paid for additional direct cost incurred due to customer focused due to customer cost delays and therefore submits a claim against the customer to recover a portion of these costs. The claim process is in its early stages, but the contractor has a long history of successfully negotiating claims with customers, although sometimes at a discount from the amount sought. Now, how should the contractor account for the claim? Now, in this scenario, the, the the contractor will have to consider history of successful negotiations of similar claims or with the same customer. They'll have to review the type of claim, the cost claim, and the methodology used to arrive at the claim revenue. Also, they'll have to focus on who prepared the claim. Was it an expert or was it a project manager? Significant judgment is required even if the contractor has successful history of negotiating claims, particularly if the claim is with unrelated or new customers. The key to documentation is, is you have to put through, you have to consider certain factors to document the support constraining estimates of variable consideration. And the factors to consider include whether the amount is highly susceptible to factors outside the entity's influence. Those factors include the judgment of actions of third parties. Given that claim involves a lot of litigation sometimes, the outcome may not be that clear as, as the contractor may want to be. So again, there, there are different factors that has to be considered while analyzing claim revenue that, that should be included as part of, of your total contract price. The uncertainty about the amount of consideration, again, if it's not expected to be resolved for a long period of time, that has to be considered. The entity's experience with similar type of contract, if it's limited or if it has limited predictive value, then also that has to be considered. And finally, if there are possible outcomes that have broad range of possible consideration amounts, then that also has to be factored before recognizing any revenue related to the claim. In, in short, you might do the entire analysis of, of the claim and you might come to the conclusion that only a minor amount uh, could be part of the contract price, that is fine. But at the end of the day, uh, you have to you, you can only recognize revenue to the extent that a significant portion cannot be unrecognized at a later stage when the uncertainty is resolved. So that's, that's the key to recognizing any variable consideration. Now, the third example is pretty much updating estimates of variable consideration. So in this example, the initial contract is for designing and construction of an industrial manufacturing fa facility for a fixed price of 100 million, plus an award or a penalty fee of plus or minus $5 million tied directly to certain objective metrics around quality, schedule, and productivity. So initially, the contractor kind of concludes that given that the contractor is inexperienced in this type of project and potential turnover in key positions, so hence, when bidding the contract, the entity did not expect to successfully attain positive metrics tied to the award fee or penalty and estimated a penalty of $5 million. The most likely transaction price at the start of the contract was therefore $95 million. As the contract neared completion, the contractor became confident that all key metrics were going to be met or exceeded. Based on this updated information, the entity concludes that they will not be in a position of incurring a penalty, but rather benefit from the full potential award. And it is probable that a significant reversal in the cumulative amount of revenue will not occur when the uncertainty is resolved. Therefore, the entity includes the 5 million award fee in the transaction price. The most likely transaction price is therefore updated to 105 million an accumulative catch-up adjustment in revenues recorded.
so step four, um, this, this should not be have a major effect on the construction industry for most of your contracts with single performance obligations, but this does come into play when you have a single contract with multiple performance obligations. So should you have a single contract with only one defined price, but you have more than one performance obligation, you then have to allocate that transaction price appropriately. Now, before I get into that, generally some of the contracts that will have more than one performance obligation during your bid process might have already been identified in terms of costs um, and price. So in, in any of those cases, you're going to go obviously with what your bid is for those multiple performance obligations. So this is only when you have, when that is not an observable price on your contract, when you have a performance obligation that hasn't been defined. Um, so there's acceptable methods for estimating the standalone selling price of a good or service. Um, there's a few more, but these are the, the main ones, the three listed below. Um, the adjusted market assessment, uh, which is essentially your competitor selling price adjusted for your entity's costs and margins. Again, this isn't wouldn't be that likely. Um, the the middle one that the expected cost plus margin, that, that is going to be your main approach um, that we'll see in the construction industry, um, and this is been very common practice to have estimated costs for the for the performance obligation and then adding on a margin or approach, kind of like a, a, a T&M job. And the last one there is a residual approach, uh, which is essentially a plug um, saying if you have, let's say you have three performance obligations within a contract and the entire contract price we know is 400,000 and you already know that um, performance obligation one and two combined for 300,000, well then the odd man out is the 100,000 that would go to performance obligation three. Um, probably won't to see too much of this, but you need to be careful that if that's the way that you are going to approach it, that the third performance obligation, you're not entering into at a loss or at a discount position. Uh, if you are, that will have to be reassessed and kind of re uh, reapplied evenly over the remaining performance obligations. And then lastly, an entity may allocate a, a discount or an amount of contingent consideration entirely to one performance obligation if certain conditions are met. Again, this is going to be unlikely. I don't think many of our construction contractors are offering discounts up front um, and have them in the wording of the contract. But if, if there are contracts that do have discount wording, you need to be aware um, that those will need to be applied um, usually evenly unless there's these certain conditions are met. So I just want to walk through a quick example of allocation of a transaction price. So a contractor agrees to demolish old parking lot and construct a new one in the front of a customer's hospital building and to construct a new unconnected patio area and pavilion behind the building. The contractor determines that there are two separate performance obligations in the contract. First, the replacement of the parking lot. Second, the new patio and pavilion. Based on the terms of the contract, the contractor determines that the transaction price is $300,000. The contractor estimates the market value to allocate the transaction price to the distinct performance obligations. Assuming the con contractor determines the market value to replace the parking lot to be 275000 and the market value to construct a new patio area and pavilion behind the building to be 50000 the transaction price allocated to each performance obligation would be as follows. So essentially, you're taking the percentage uh, because it doesn't equal $300,000 exactly. You're taking the percentages of the 275 and the 50 and applying those uh, to the $300,000. So step five, um, recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfies the performance obligation. Now generally, for most uh, construction, they're going to be recognized over time. And the first step is to determine whether you're going to recognize it over time or at a single point in time. So performance obligation is satisfied over time when at least one of the following criteria are met, and that's the customer receives and consumes the benefits of the entity's performance as the entity performs. Generally, this one's not going to meet a lot of the construction criteria um, because you really cannot consume the benefit until the project has been completed. Um, but the next two are going to be the ones that construction really falls under, which is the entity's performance creates or enhances a customer-controlled asset, um, for example, work in progress. And then lastly, an asset with an alternative use to the entity is not created, but the entity has the right to payment for performance completed to date. Um, so 
the, and the last one is methods for recognizing revenue. So once you've decided that you're going to recognize it over time and that you fall under one of these criteria for recognizing it over time, you're going to want to determine whether you use the input method or output method. And for the majority of our construction clients and construction in general, they're going to choose the input method, which is you're going to recognize revenue based on costs, labor hours, labor costs, machine hours. Um, and generally, you'll shy away from the output methods, which are units produced or delivered, surveys for goods and services. Uh, the reason being on the output method, the output method doesn't allow you to recognize work in progress, which generally most of our construction um, jobs you'll want to recognize over a point in time as your construction uh, proceeds. So the other thing, too, that we'll get into in, in terms of recognizing revenue, uh, there's a couple... Uh, special considerations that we're going to be going over shortly that fall under this that relate to uninstalled materials um, and uh, excess work or work that should not have been done on the contract that we'll we'll go over as well that come into play. Now the first one under special consideration relates to significant uh, uninstalled materials, and again, if you do have this, then the, the criteria that's being noted here uh, needs to be performed at contract inception and throughout the duration of the contract. So basically, if the good is not distinct, the customer is expected to obtain control of the good before receiving services related to the good. Cost of transferred good is, in, is significant related to the total expected cost, or the entity procures the good from a third party and is not significantly involved in designing and manufacturing the good. Basically, the entity is acting as a principal. If the above criteria are met, then revenue equal to cost when control of the item transferred to the customer but are not installed. I mean, in short, if you have significant uninstalled materials as part of your project, then you have to kind of equal your revenue to the cost and not recognize any profit on that cost when you are using percentage completion method or the new terminology, which is your input method based on cost to cost. So you have to exclude that so that you're not realizing excess revenue that was specifically attributed to the installation of the uninstalled materials. So until you install that material, you cannot recognize the profit on that. That's, that's the bottom line. The second one is the termination for convenience clause. So if you have a contract, uh, so basically the way it is that a contract does not exist if each party to the contract has the unilateral enforceable right to terminate a wholly unperformed contract without compensating the other party. If you have a clause similar to this, then it's, it's a service contract. It, it's not going to be a long-term contract. Now, currently, I believe AICPA has recommended this to the FASB to look into this specifically and, and make sure this is appropriate because in, in the construction world, uh, there, are, there is a language uh, that kind of has termination clause in it, and, and they want to make sure that this is being addressed correctly and contractors are still able to use uh, input method uh, based on, on the long-term duration of those contracts. The second key thing is the significant inefficiency. This is something new that, that wasn't there before. So if there is a significant labor inefficiency or wasted materials that was not anticipated at contract inception, then those costs have to be written off dollar for dollar, meaning you cannot recognize revenue for those costs. Now, determining which cost represents unexpected or wasted materials, labor, or other resources, that's going to require significant judgment. But some examples that's being provided in the standard and also by AICPA when they were working on the specific issues for construction uh, includes extended labor strikes or design or construction execution errors that result in significant wasted resources that may require adjustment. And these items, as I said, should be expensed as incurred and no revenue should be recognized while using the input method. Now, while we're talking about inefficiencies, these are significant inefficiencies that were unanticipated and not something that you would already expect 
uh, at the bid time because there are always certain amount of inefficiencies that go in a contract execution. But but these are significant inefficiencies which are rare, but they do occur. So if they do occur, then then that's the accounting uh, that needs to be done. Um, with regard to your principal versus agent, th this comes into play. So if, if the entity controls the specified good or service before it is transferred to the customer, then the entity is acting as a principal and the revenue should be recognized as gross. So if a contractor is a construction manager and they have a lot of subcontractors working on a project, in that case, the construction manager would be the principal, and then all the revenue is kind of recognized as gross. However, if the entity is kind of merely arranging for another party to provide the specified good or service, but they do not control the quality of the final output that's being provided by another party, then the revenue is recognized net, given that it's going to be on a commission basis or a fee basis. Uh, contract cost. Now, everything that's under this bullet point uh, more or less applies to major contractors or public companies. The, the, the impact on private entities would be minimal. But again, if you do have scenarios uh, with regard to significant pre-contract cost uh, or incremental cost or a direct cost of fulfilling a contract, uh, then, then some of the regulations in the accounting standard would apply. So if you have pre-contract cost, uh, then it can be capitalized if it is recoverable and if it is related to a specified contract and uh, somehow it's going to be uh, recovered uh, through the bid or if it's already included in the pricing. Uh, same thing for your incremental cost of obtaining a contract. An example is a sales commission. Uh, the entity can capitalize if the entity expects to recover them directly or indirectly, and then amortize them over the duration of the contract. But there's a practical expedient that allows immediate expense recognition if the contract is one year or less in duration. Uh, same thing with your direct cost of fulfilling a contract. Again, they can relate to a future performance and are expected to be recovered under the contract. Example, your mobilization cost. If you are incurring those costs before the contract began, but again, if they're going to be recovered uh, through your contract, then you can capitalize those and amortize them uh, over the duration of the contract. Again, if, 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 if none of these costs are significant, if, if none of these costs are not significant, then, then you don't have to change the accounting uh, methodology. But again, if these are significant, then you certainly want to look into the accounting practices uh, for these costs. Uh, the second item is the warranties. Uh, the key here is that can a customer buy this separately? And if it's embedded in contract price, then this needs to be segregated. If the contractor is providing only assurance type warranty, which is again required by law or by some state regulation, that you have to go in and fix anything minor that, that happens within a year, then that's fine. That's, that's not the type of warranty that needs to be segregated. However, if the contractor provides a separate service warranty, but that has been included in the contract price as well, then if it's significant, then, it has, if, if it's significant, then, then that has to be segregated. Uh, with regard to lost contracts, any loss on existing contracts, um, Nothing has changed. The accounting is uh, consistent with current guidance, which means you would accrue the cost as soon as you find out uh, that you're going to lose money on a contract. With regard to presentation and disclosures, again, there, there are some changes that there under the new standard. Uh, currently, we call we have terms called cost in excess of billings and then billings in excess of cost. Those terms would be contract asset and contract liability under the new standard. Again, the key is that you have to distinguish between your unconditional right to consideration, which is your contract receivable, whereas your contract asset is, is, is a conditional right to receive a consideration. With regard to disclosures, uh, there are some additional disclosure requirements, both qualitative and quantitative. 
So that's, that's again, a major change from existing requirement. So there would be information that would need to be provided with regard to the disaggregation of the revenue. Uh, at a minimum, the standard requires that you provide disaggregation at a level that shows you the timing of transfer of goods or services, which could be a point in time and over time. And for public entities, there are a lot more requirements uh, when it comes to disaggregation. The second thing that you need to disclose is the reconciliation of your contract balances, which means you have to disclose your opening and closing balance of your contract asset, contract liabilities, and receivables from contracts with its customers. And you also have to explain any significant swing or changes between your contract asset and receivables. So once your conditional right becomes an unconditional right, that's what you have to explain uh, in your disclosure, what resulted in those changes. And again, this opening and closing balance of contract asset has to be done uh, on, on a financial statement level. You don't have to do this on a contract level. Uh, your revenue recognition or your performance obligation policies has to be disclosed. Uh, and then you have to, if, if you want, you can also disclose a transaction price that allocated to remaining performance obligation. But again, that's optional for non-public entities. And then if you have any significant estimates, then you have to uh, include them uh, in your footnote disclosures as well. Uh, the second bullet point, that's the method inputs and assumptions used to assess whether an estimate of variable consideration is constrained. This would come into play when you have judgment involved, whether with regard to your use, your use of your expected value or most likely amount, and also with regard to the constraint that gets applied when you recognize revenue related to your claims or your unpriced change order. So you have to include those estimates and assumptions that has been made um, in, in your footnote disclosures. Again, the standard is, is effective uh, for uh, non-public entities for 2000 calendar year end. Um, and if you have a 930 year end or, or something in between, then your implementation date would change accordingly. And there are two transition methods. There's a full retrospective and then modified retrospective. Um, majority of the contractors, if they have um, instances or scenarios where they have to go back and change some of their contracts in progress, then I believe modified retrospective would be the way to go and do your restatements because your full retrospective would kind of require you to apply new gap to comparative financial presented. So I think modified retrospective would, would be a better way to do it. And these are some practical considerations uh, as you go through and assess the implementation for your industry, for your company. I think you might want to review the contracts for combination possibility. You have to identify contracts that may have multiple obligations. For example, you know, design and build and maintain and operate. If you have all lumped in one contract, then you might want to segregate those and it has to be accounted for separately. You also want to review your contracts for significant variable consideration, whether it's your incentives, bonuses, and liquidated damages clause. Again, review your accounting for pre-construction, incremental or direct fulfillment cost if it's material. Uh, certainly look into your ability of your IT and accounting system to provide the required contract and financial reporting information because if you have one contract and, and you have multiple performance obligations, you have to be able to break that contract within the contract. So. So that's the key, and, and your accounting system uh, should be able to do that. And you'll have to decide on the transition method. You got to look at the disclosures and see what's applicable and how the entity is going to collect the information. Certainly update the internal controls and policies and procedures surrounding the revenue recognition. 
uh, make sure your key members of the accounting and project team have proper understanding about the key elements of new revenue recognition standard, including um, identification of performance obligations during contract inception and also while you know writing a change order. And finally, discuss the implementation with your audit team as you move along. And to wrap this up, at the end of the day, the, the key is to make sure that, that you are able to identify uh, performance obligations in your contract, because that, that's a major change uh, with regard to how you would recognize revenue, you do your disclosures, everything uh, is going to revolve around the performance obligation. So that's, that's the key. Yeah. If, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to submit them in the in the questions tab. At this point in time, if you have any questions, any concerns, we would be more than happy to address those. We'll, we'll stay on for for a few more minutes, but if you don't have any questions, appreciate you joining us today, and have a great day. Okay, I believe uh, one of the questions that uh, came out is about the effective date. So yeah, so uh, the effective date for non-public companies is for annual reporting period beginning after December 15, 2018. So if you are a calendar year entity, then this standard would be effective January 1st, 2019. So yeah, when you do your financials for uh, year ending December 31st, 2019, then, then you have to make sure that you're presenting your financials uh, and implementing this new standard. Well, once again, we would like to thank you for your time uh, for attending this webinar. And if you have uh, any questions, you can certainly reach out uh, to me or Steve. Our contact information is right there on the slide, and we would be more than happy to assist you uh, with, with the new implementation and any questions that you may have as you move towards uh, analyzing uh, the standard internally for your company. Thank you.